I do one quick thing? Yes. 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 Glenn, what do you say? Go for it. We're on the last, we can do it, we're tough, we can handle this. I, just, I wanted to show you how science, the last one. you've been talking about <laughs> science, okay? What are you saying? What? Nothing, no sweater. <laughs> <laughs> right? So we've been talking about science, okay? And, and I, I, I got into a lot of this stuff because magic is science. It really is, okay? All magic is science, not all science is magic. In fact, very little is, is that way. So, and there have been these people who have really seriously studied some of the phenomenon that, uh, like, uh, dolphin tears and their efficacy, you know, and there are people that get millions and millions of dollars to study these things. So I want to show you something that's very curious. These are called Zener cards. These are ESP cards. How many people have seen these before? Raise your hand. Okay, for those who have not seen them, this is the real deal. These, these are not trick cards. These were made at Duke University with the J.D. Ryan Parapsychology Laboratory uh, back in the late 40s, early 50s. J.D. Ryan and his wife, forget her name, they started testing people for ESP. Because up until then, that's why it was interesting how we talked about the telescope. A hundred years, look what's, what happens with science. And if you go back to the 40s, uh, at that time, these were for real, okay? These are the ESP symbols that they would test with. And uh, I'm going to show you something to show you how science can be subverted given, given a, not, you know, a proper amount of time. So what J.D. Ryan did is he made these five symbols. I'm going to show you. <coughs> there's the star. There's the plus symbol. There's the wavy lines, or some people call this bacon. <laughs> there's the square and the circle. So there's only five symbols, and they're repeated five times in the path. Okay? Um, the idea here is if you mix them, and somebody is able to identify them, if you go through a run of 25, meaning I stand over there, you turn them over, I tell you what I think they are, if you get five right out of 25, that is called chance. That is what is normal. It doesn't mean anything. But if I do 10 runs of 25, and I get five or more each time, supposedly that which was showing some sort of extrasensory perception. That's where the term came from. J.B. Ryan. So these are the actual cards that he used. And they're amazing because they're made so that they're in, almost impossible to mark on the back. It's called a star field. And it'd be very hard to mark these. And if you try to put any ink on any part of it, you can see them, okay? So I'm going to try a little experiment. And um, remember, there's five of each and repeated five times. So um, if this gentleman here, would you just cut, cut the packet, go like this, cut some over to the top here. And we'll go to this lady here, if you just cut them someplace. And we'll complete the cut like that. And one more cut to screw. You know, they say three's a charm. All right? Now, I need somebody to help me out who's got a coat on. Who has a, a coat or a, a coat with maybe a shirt with a pocket on it? Nobody. Man, nobody. <laughs> You're looking around. All right, you can come up, sir, if you would. So I'm going to give you three three cards if you'd stand right here. Now remember, one out of one out of five doesn't count for anything. I'm going to ask you to put this one in your top shirt pocket. Don't look at it, though. Don't look at it. And then you're going to take the next one, put this one in your right pants pocket. Don't look at it. And finally the third one in your left pants pocket. Alright? So now I'm going to give these a little mix and I'm going to put them the balance of the packet in my pocket. So, science, ladies and gentlemen. If I take these cards, put them in my pocket, and by the way, there's nothing in my pocket. After that last one, you're not taking it. <laughs> so these go in my pocket. So this uses what is called dermo-optic perception. <laughs> See how I use these science-y terms? Like Chopra. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you can work these into the, your routine, it, it makes it more believable. That means seeing with the fingertips. Okay. 
So we have random, you don't know anything, I don't know anything at this point. So what I'm going to try and do is match symbol for symbol. Since there's five of each in the pack, I'm going to use my fingertips and not my eyes, a sixth sense, if you will. So you get to randomize this by deciding which one do you want to go to first, the one in your shirt pocket, the right or the left? Is that the left? The right, right, the right pocket? pocket? Okay. So. Uh, I want you to, you know, when I start out, I have to warm up a little bit. So if you take the one in your right-hand pocket out, and let me, let me see it. Star, okay? Right-hand pocket. Here we go. And here's in your pocket. I don't get this right. No. <laughs> choice again, which uh, left pocket? Okay, the left pocket, but this time, show it to the audience, don't let me see it. I'll look over here, I won't even look at the TV cameras. Everybody got it? Yeah. Got it. All right, hold it down so I can't see it face down. Like this, hold it like this. <clears throat> All right, what did you see? We're at the uh, right pocket, right? Left pocket. Now, if I was Geller, I'd take 10 minutes. Of the <laughs> so I'm going to take this one. Hold your card like this on the count of three. One, two, three. Oh. Woo! <laughs> that was the luckiest day of my life, ladies and gentlemen. Well, and now the last one. This one, you don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, right? Okay, so. Before we go for the last one, I'm going to give you the full balance of the packet here. Go ahead and give those a mix any way you want. Because I'm going to go for, for you, ladies and gentlemen, the ultimate. I don't normally do this, but you've been so warm throughout the day at helping me. I'll go one more scientific leap into the unknown. Here we go. Packet goes into the pocket. Take the card out, sir. Do not look at it, because I don't want to have people say, I would read your mind. Because I could read his mind, maybe, and be able to get it. So you don't know what it is, I don't know what it is. Bring it out here like this. I'm going to throw myself to fate, ladies and gentlemen, on the count of three. One, two, three. Woo! So I'm not going to give you the secret of this, but one line, because here's the science. The best part about this is these cards were designed by scientists. But there are so many, what's the word? In, imperfections in the design of these cards and the statistical nature of these cards that magicians have been using them ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so you can find it. It's, it's, it's a good one. Okay, so our last speaker is Glenn Church. Hey, let me find his information. I know Glenn, but I want to make sure I get his credits right. So he is a God, I can't remember. political, environmental, and tech issues. That's what he is the most interested in. Um, he's been six years. He's head of the not head. Six years. I can't read my own. <laughs> Okay. Oh, you're a mind reader. Grassroots organizer. Political. <laughs> Grassroots organizer. I'm trying to read this oh, part here. Six years board of Amnesty oh, board International. Board of Amnesty International. That's what I was trying to get to. Board of Amnesty International. So he is a seeker of truth, ladies and gentlemen. He's a businessman and he's a writer. And he's going to talk to us about one of the biggies here. Talk about a shell game, okay? Political skepticism. Let's hear it. Unfortunately, I'm, uh, I'm kind of going to kind of old school. I didn't know we had all this high tech stuff here until it was really too late. So I got a flip chart, circa 1980. I'm not going to use it. Yeah, so I'll shut it off. 
And uh, <coughs> I guess I could have asked some questions and figured out what resources were available, but I didn't do that. So I wasn't very skeptical of me. Um, so let's go back in time instead. Glenn, do you want me to turn the light back on? Yeah. Yeah, it'll make better video. Sure. Whatever uh, we know over here. Should I put this on? Okay. I know my belt. What do I do with this? Swallow it. Well, I can do that. Pro-life, they might be thinking they're they're using reason 
to come to that. And that might be very true what they're doing. Because skepticism is not a conclusion. It's a process. It's a process and, and it can lead you to some different conclusions. Not just in politics, but in other things. But it's particularly in politics. What One thing that you have to look at here, if you want to apply skepticism to politics and be a political skeptic, you got to really realize it, there isn't an ideology there either. It's going to be it's going to be something where you're really going in. It's a nonpartisan approach, and I don't mean that yeah, if you're a Democrat or Republican, you got to give up your registration to, to be a political skeptic. No, I mean is that you're not going to have to follow certain dogma. You're, you're going to be open-minded about things. And that's, and that's really what we're being a, a political skeptic would be about. So let's look on to some of the other... Oh, one, you know, one thing I should say is if you really... As I say, there's no real ideology. You could be a Democrat and a Republican. You could be a Libertarian. You could be a Communist if you apply this. It's just... It, it's, as again, I just really want to emphasize it's really about a process. So one of the big things going on is misinformation, and this really is, you know, Marx touched upon this, is, uh, it, you know, it, it's, it's a con job going on. Okay, I guess I didn't. Um, there's, there's a con job really going on when you look around at the media and, and where information is coming from and on the Internet. Looking, you know, 30 years ago, you could see the major networks, they have... Dan Rather, or Walter Cronkite, or whoever it was on there giving the news, and they gave it relatively impartial. Now you go on, you got Fox News, and half of what they've got to say has supposedly political pundits on there. Or, you know, it's also true up on the left, MSNBC. It's, you're all given slants. Everybody's given a slant. You're not getting, it's hard to find the straight news, and difficult to find it and locate it. And, when, and you've, got, you've got people then that are really, misleading and mis distorting the truth, factual distortions, half-truths, and untruths. People I'm kind of talking about that are really misleading things, people like the Rush Limbaugh's or Glenn Beck or Michael Savage. Or you go to, out to, to people like Alex Jones. If you know who Alex Jones is, he's never, he's never met a conspiracy he didn't like. And one of his, his cohorts is a, a guy named Mike Adams, who has um, been on the show. He publishes a, a site called Natural News, which it's, again, it's also filled with distortions, filled, filled with conspiracies. Uh, th these are the people who, who are putting information out there, and when you have 100 or 150 million people not voting, not really caring enough about politics, they hear stuff like this, and they think, wow, that's true. I heard what Rush Limbaugh said, or I hear what somebody else says. Or in another case, with the anti-vaccine movement, with Jamie McCarthy, they'll go, oh, here's a attractive looking woman, she wants to know what she's talking about because she used to be a Playboy centerfold. <laughs> so yeah, I want her telling me about vaccines and what's going on and how I should uh, take care of the health of my kids. But she's a celebrity. And that means a lot, especially to people who really don't pay attention. Which is one of the reason why when you only have 80 million or 120 or 130 million people voting, it's, it's really scary because you got most of the people out there who don't have any idea and they can be just led like cattle along. And that's where it's important for every one of us to really step up and make a, make a statement in our own little lives, in our own worlds, and how we can affect, lead people who might be misinformed. Because these people, they're going to be the loudest the most emotional, the most extreme voices, and they'll prevail if we're quiet. Or you know, as Mark saying, we just can't do nothing. And that concludes everything, all these important issues. And it's particularly important, I think, really now, because technology and science are more and more important in our lives. I mean, we're, look what's happened in the last decades. Imagine what's going to happen in the next decades. And, and you've got people that... Rush Limbaugh, Alex Jones, they don't care about the, about the facts. They don't care really about how the science is going to come down unless it's supporting them. Oh, one thing I'll, I'll kind of uh, go back here is I, a couple of years ago, Bill Nye, um, 
debated a, a fellow named um, Ken. Ken. Yes, he's a um, the creator of this uh, museum in Kentucky <laughs> called the Creation Museum. He's just having some financial problems, and this is right now. And it's a story all in itself. <laughs> now I got a lot of criticism for doing this because he was being told, "Hey, you're a scientist," and this guy he's he thinks the Earth was started 8,000 years ago, and people were put on, you know, put put on Earth like uh, like some magic trick from Mark Edward. So, Nye went ahead and did this debate, and it, I think it was a great thing because it, he wasn't giving Ham legitimacy. Ham's going to go out there and put his his narrow view out into the world. And if nobody isn't there to challenge it, then you're going to have these people, again, this 100 to 150 million Americans, who really aren't aware enough to care, they're going to listen to that and they're going to say, well, you know, I'm not sure about evolution or creation, you know, I'm kind of in between, but I hear this guy Ham. Well, when you get, you can only confront these people with the truth. And maybe you're not going to change Ken Ham or his followers, but you might change the people that are in between. Because in politics, most issues are 40% on one side, 40% on another, and the middle is just 20%. You get something that goes out a 60-40 vote on an issue or on a candidate, that's considered a landslide. Yeah, there's sometimes there's more than that. It goes 70 or 30 or so. That's usually a gerrymandered district at some point. But most things are this way, and the fight is for this. These are the people that make the decision. And unfortunately, the ones who tend to vote are over here and over here. These are the people who are already voting on the other two sides. The people in the middle, you've got to motivate to vote. They're the ones who really don't care. They're that 100, 150 million who aren't motivated. And that is really scary. So, let's see Oh, yes. And we move on here to the next big issue, science denialism. I'm going to knock this thing off yet. For me, I, no skeptic should put one issue as their main thing that they want to push on because you, you can't really evaluate things. But sometimes, you, sometimes it's hard to get information if you want to look at, around at a candidate or something. If I had one question that I had to put for somebody, whether they're running for a water board or for president of the United States, I ask, do you believe in evolution? Because that answer is going to tell me everything, pretty much everything I want to know about that person's philosophy. And this is a, a poll that Gallup puts out periodically. The last one shows that 42% of Americans believe that God created humans in a present form. 42%. Now you've got 31% who believe in evolution, but it's guided by God. This is sort of the, the Pope Francis uh, group. And then you got the 19% who believe that God didn't have any role. I, I don't have any problem with this 31 or the 19. I mean, they, they're believing in evolution. They're believing in some science. Fortunately, that's 50%. And 50% is the real threshold to really get legislation and change covered. So when you got 42% over here, I get close to 50%. And believe me, if you have 50% of the American people, or over 50% believing, and creationism, you're going to get a lot of strange legislation happening. <laughs> so, um, anyway, here's another one on science. And this one, I'm going to go over on this one. This one really gets kind of interesting. This is AP poll was done. 94% of Americans believe smoking causes cancer. 92% mental illnesses affects the brain. 91% we got DNA encoded in us. 88% Antibiotics cause overuse. Antibiotics cause drug-resistant bacteria. You've got 83% down here believing in vaccines. Although you got this 15% from the Jenny McCarthy uh, yeah. movement kind of growing up. But you start getting down here. Climate change, 61%, 37% disagree. Evolution. This is evolution as a general. It's almost the same figure we saw in the other one, which was really human evolution. But you got actually another 5% of the people who say, "Yeah, I don't believe humans." And evolution, but I believe in evolution. <laughs> you still have that 42% who just deny evolution. Uh, Earth is four and a half billion years old, 
but you can't get a majority on how old the universe is or about the Big Bang effect happened. What's happening here? Why, why is this? These are all facts. This is all science. Uh, what's happening down here is that people, a large percentage of American population, at least a third, is picking and choosing their science according to their ideology and what they believe. They don't want to believe in climate change or in evolution, so they deny it. Although, one thing I'll look at that's really interesting here, I don't know if anybody's picked this up. Here you got 42% of the people say evolution isn't happening. <coughs> Over here, you got, uh, yeah, you overuse bacteria, and uh, they overuse antibiotics, and bacteria will evolve. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess that's the micro versus the macro, which I've never quite understood, but supposedly is that you can have small evolutionary change, and somehow hits a brick wall, and it supposedly stops. <laughs> But at least look at that as some of these people can be converted. Yeah. You know, I mean, there, there, there's some parts of it, it is anti-scientific. Some parts of it are not. I, you look at what lots happened with the Catholic Church. I mean, they're, compared to a lot of the Protestant denominations out there, uh, your, 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 your fundamentalist Christians, I mean, Pope Francis looks like he's... Again, a science education, yeah. <laughs> not, not a, a theology education. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, there, there's, I, I, I don't think there's immediately necessarily an opposition. How would you go about changing? Uh, you, you know, I, I think you, you, it's got to be done. Anything's going to be changed. It's really got to be by education. As skeptics, we're not going to go through and put out laws and say, okay, let's ban psychics out here, and, and uh, that's, not, that's just going to drive them underground, and then they won't be up for discussion. I mean, if we're going to change things, we're going to do it by education, which is why I'm telling people to speak out, talk to people. Yes? I actually think the middle number in the statistics is really important. Like people who think that evolution is real, but also believe in an intelligent being. Yes. So you're opening it up on both sides. And the kids that are getting educated, but also have traditional religious backgrounds who are saying, I accept this whole thing. So I think it's a really hopeful number. Absolutely. And Yeah, it's, it's important you're believing in evolution. Bring and try to 